morning, everyone. It is 1030 on Wednesday, November 17th, which means it is time to sip your morning beverage as we present another session of Coffee Chat, Thompson Hines web series on matters related to the financial services industries. My name is Philip Sinning. I am a senior managing associate at Thompson Hines, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Mark Miner, senior counsel at the firm. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Mark and I practice in the investment management group at the firm, but we're also the two members of the group with extensive litigation backgrounds. Um, Mark was the chief of the Investor Protection Bureau of the New York Attorney General's Office and the chief of the Bureau of Securities of the New Jersey Attorney General's Office. He's also served as chief compliance officer of Marstone. I have 15 years business litigation experience, including here at Thompson High and in the New York office of White and Case, where I was primarily engaged on the defense side. Uh, so when today's topic was selected, Section 36B excessive fee litigation, it was a natural fit for us, wouldn't you say, Mark? <laughs> Absolutely, it's been some interesting uh, uh, topics to uh, to go over today and I'm looking forward to it. Great, well, let's just, just, just set it up for our, our, our viewers. Um, the Tenth Circuit's decision this summer in a, a best low versus Great West Life and Annuity marked another victory for investment advisors in a decade-long wave of excessive fee litigation. Today, we'll explore the rise of excessive fee cases since 2010. Uh, we'll discuss whether the Great West decision signals an end to Section 36B excessive fee cases and what lays ahead for advisors going forward. Just a few quick reminders before we get started. If you have any questions or comments during today's program, please join in by using the Q&A box on your control panel. We will address your comments as we move through our discussion. Um, if we don't get to your question or if we run out of time, please accept our apologies, uh, but rest assured that we will follow up with you after the program. But before we get to Great West, uh, let's take a step back and look at what brought us to this junction. Uh, Section 36B of the 1940 Act establishes a fiduciary duty on the part of fund advisors with respect to their fees. It also gives shareholders the right to bring lawsuits in federal court for breaches of this duty. To prove a breach of Section 36B, a plaintiff must show that the advisor's compensation is so disproportionately large that it bears no reasonable relationship to the services rendered and could not have been the product of arm's length bargaining. In 2010, the US Supreme Court issued a ruling in Jones v. Harris Associates, which formally adopted the Second Circuit's Gartenberg standard to address and analyze alleged violations of 36B. Mark, could you give us a quick overview of the Gartenberg factors? Uh, sure, I don't want to get too lost in this, but almost all of the cases uh, that we are going to discuss today uh, over the past decade are looking to uh, this standard, some more uh, of the elements uh, than others. But very quickly, the Gartenberg factors include um, in analyzing the, re the reasonableness test that you just articulated, the nature and quality of the services provided, the profitability of the advisor, any follow-up financial benefits uh, to the advisor, and that can mean a number of things, we may get into that. The advisor's costs and whether it shared any economies of scale uh, with the fund, and um, th that is a, a particular uh, provision that uh, lots of uh, plaintiffs seem to uh, to uh, argue, and we'll talk, we can talk a little bit about that and uh, comparisons of fees paid by similar funds. So courts will also take into account the independence and conscientiousness of the fund board uh, in evaluating fees, which you know was huge in the, in the cases before us. That's right. And it's important to note that not any single one of these factors are dispositive in the analysis, right? Uh, you're looking at the totality of the circumstances. So, um, you know, it, it, it's the big picture and it's all of these factors combined. Now, obviously, um, as, 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 as a board or as, a, as an advisor, you want all of these to, to be in your favor. And the more, of course, that you have of those, um, the better. But it is important to note that not any one factor is dispositive. Correct, correct. 
And so when, when many industry when, when many industry observers um, reviewed the court's unanimous ruling in Jones, um, they thought it was a victory for defendants and it would dissuade plaintiffs um, from launching 36B challenges. Um, but instead, the ruling actually had a reverse effect and it set off the current wave, this decade long wave in excessive fee litigation. Mark, were, were you surprised to see a new wave of litigation after Jones? You know, in talking about these cases, it seems like uh, there are particular strategies that plaintiffs uh, have uh, looked uh, towards, sometimes focusing on one uh, part of the test. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, how this has gone on for the, the better part of 10 years. Um, industry, you know, took a bit of a victory lap. Um, yeah, I say not so fast. Um, I believe that uh, unless uh, there is something in uh, a, a case that is elevated and changes this test, it's around for a while. Uh, so I, I say that the plaintiff's bar may be a bit battered, um, but it may come back in, in some other uh, iterations. And, and, and I have to agree. I mean, as lawyers, we could argue any side of the case. And I think both the plaintiff's bar and the defendant's bar claimed victory after Jones. Um, procedurally for plaintiffs, it was easy enough for them to find a shareholder to be named a plaintiff, and it was easy enough to plead allegations to survive a motion to dismiss. Um, substantively, it was a win for defendants because the Gardenberg factors presented a very high um, burden of proof. And as, as we discussed, it, it's a multi-factor test, not any single one is dispositive, and, and the courts will look at the totality of, of the circumstances. I, I looked at these cases and, and I noted that um, in, in the past 11 years that they, they fell into three categories of, of, of lawsuits. Um, the first, which has been deemed the manager of managers lawsuits, uh, where plaintiffs um, alleged that the advisory fees uh, retained by advisors were excessive in light of the service that they actually provided. There was a second category of, of lawsuits uh, where um, plaintiffs alleged that advisors uh, received fees for their proprietary funds that were excessive when compared uh, to the fees they received for similar services they provided as sub-advisors to non-proprietary funds. And then third is this catch-all, this all other uh, bucket that was predicated on a variety of, um, uh, of theories of liability. Um, was, was that your observation too, Mark? Hey. Yes, although uh, you know all cases are not uh, the same. When you look at the language of the decisions and the way that the courts have uniformly uh, arrived at results that were favorable to the to the defendants, the considerations were uh, rather different based on the manager of manager lawsuits and the sub advisory lawsuits. Um, there's been a lot of hand wringing in the industry, you know, saying, "Can't we really be done with this?" Um, but they are so case specific that you really can't look to the precedent of one particular case to say that it's going to be dispositive of, of the others. Um, you know, and defendants particularly are in the light of the, light of the, the, uh, the case that uh, Oslo case um, are asking, you know, can't we finally uh, be done with this? Uh, I'd argue something a bit different, which is defendants may have kind of the best of both worlds um, here. If you look at the analyses in uh, either of these types of, of cases, I'd say that defendants um, have the cover of saying, look, uh, investors still have a remedy here if there is a case to be made and a fund um, is using um, or determining uh, ex excessive fees or not going through the appropriate steps or not meeting, not meeting the, the Gartenberg factors. Um, but you can say that really without substantial risk, um, I would say, of a loss, uh, unless you really fumble those those factors. And the courts have really been deferential to a board's ability to prudently assess the reasonableness of those risks um, and have created a really high wall to climb over. Well, it's really interesting. I, I you know. As you know, it is a fact-intensive inquiry, and these are all case-specific. But as you started out, 
um, courts have found way to reach a very uniform decision uh, and, just, and disposition of all of these cases, which is counterintuitive. Uh, you know, you, you you would think that there would be an outlier, um, and, and in fact, you know, um, in, 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 in up until uh, the Tenth Circuit's uh, decision, and, and, and quite frankly, um, still, like there has yet to be a finding of liability or a judgment against an advisor. Um, uh, on, for a violation of 36B, which, you know, defendants would, would, would take heart, heart in that. Uh, I think you're right that it hasn't exactly been a route for defendants because litigation costs, um, particularly discovery costs, um, are high and they have pushed many uh, to, a, to, to private settlements um, that, 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 that are undisclosed. So um, perhaps plaintiffs have not completely, you know, com completely lost um, in, 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 in this in, in this excessive fee battle. Well, I mean, cases, you know, we're still being brought, right? And so um, if at first you don't succeed, uh, <laughs> try and try again. There have been many different bites um, at the apple from uh, different angles. I think particularly in the sub-advisory uh, lawsuits, uh, what you uh, thought going into uh, the reading of some of these cases um, was going to be a, a, a discussion about whether or not there are economies of scale that can be provided um, or fees that um, could be uh, aggregated uh, and savings passed back to investors turn into case after case where there's extensive analysis, almost an endless array of discussion from the fund's point of view of how there are fees, uh, there are features based on the product, based on the business that can't be passed on. Um, or, or need to be passed on because there are no economies of scale. And there are things that the sub-advisors are doing that are wholly independent and distinct from what the funds uh, are, are doing. Um, and it seems like each case that uh, went down that rabbit hole, you know, just found uh, a well-defended uh, case would have a, a clear record of the fees that are associated with both levels. And so particularly in the sub-advisory lawsuits, you ended up uh, with a lot of holding and dicta uh, that is really helpful uh, to the defense bar there. Well, well let, let's take take us to to the Great West case. Um, the decision this summer from the 10th Circuit affirming the District of Colorado's ruling in favor of the advisor in what's been viewed as a complete repudiation of the plaintiff's claims. Um, just, just briefly, Great West is the advisor to a mutual fund complex of approximately 60 funds. Um, it doesn't directly um, uh, guide the investment strategy, but rather engages and oversees sub-advisors for, for various funds. And the plaintiffs alleged that Great West's advisory fees and um, the certain administrative fees of an affiliate uh, were excessive for four of those funds. Um, the district court took it to trial, an 11-day trial, um, found on, in favor of, of, of Great West, and the 10th Circuit affirmed. Um, which it's been notable, or it's been noted for its emphasis on the on what we've called the sixth Gartenberg factor, the care and conscientiousness of the board, um, and it's kind of tipped its hand by by saying that the plaintiff's burden um, is an arduous standard. Um, so, Mark, like I, I think I know what, what your answer is, but is this a little bit of a reflection point or a turning point in excessive fee cases? Well, you know. I discussed a little bit about how this may come back in some other iteration. Um, I don't know that it's a it's a death note. Um, we've seen the plaintiff's bar try different modes and methods of attack. Uh, you know, but there's you know very little denying that um, uh, that it's a really uh, high bar, and plaintiffs are going to have to think differently about how to um, prove up the cases. I mean, from a litigation standpoint, it's really pretty straightforward. If you look at the cases that have been brought before and the quantum of evidence or defense, uh, many of the, the courts are finding in their decisions uh, that despite the defense not having the burden of proof, that they, there's some determination that they met um, these burdens of defense um, over and over. And so I think um, you know, the, the, the plaintiff's bar will probably go back into the lab and think about this very uh, differently. Uh, you know, it's worth the plaintiff's uh, bar, I think, thinking about 
um, whether this excessive burden, uh, well, the excessive uh, fee uh, burden um, is almost a meaningless test if it's completely insurmountable. So in theory, uh, although not yet in practice, there is a case that can be made in the instance where uh, boards do not take the care uh, to create a record uh, that establishes the conscientiousness. Uh, so um, I don't think that it's over, I, but I do think that we're not likely to see the exact same approaches um, that have not uh, been successful since 1970, really, when uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this section was first uh, passed. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, that, I, I, as you say, it's, it's not a death knell. Um, but it's certainly um, a little bit of a, a, a of a turning point. Um, you know, plaintiffs will have um, well, you should never underestimate the tenacity of a plaintiff. But 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 they'll have a, a, a new and they'll have to turn their their attention elsewhere. Um, I, I do think that um, the, the the tenth circuit's uh, decision, um, well, it, it it gave a lot of deference to a board. Right, the board somewhat and becomes the trier of fact um, in terms of the reasonableness of an advisor's fee, and absent some sort of uh, abuse of discretion, um, meaning they have a very deficient review process, or they don't have a record that they didn't create a record, um, or they they were all um, um, uh, they, they 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 just agreed to, to to renew an advisory contract without really looking or asking, doing a deep dive. Um, a court really won't disturb or, or second guess the, the, the board's um, decision. Um, so the, it does become difficult to build a case against care and conscientiousness of, of the board. Um, and interestingly, right, Mark, the, the district court even granted sanctions against the plaintiff's attorneys um, in, in, in Great West. Yeah, um, it's interesting to note that um, there was discussion um, in pretrial pleadings and briefs about the uh, the expert um, who was being offered uh, by plaintiffs uh, and questions um, about certain areas of the expert uh, report. Um, they weren't stricken, um, but plaintiff was carefully uh, um, advised against trying to, to present anything from the report that may be uh, problematic. Um, and in the course of, of the case, um, maybe sensing uh, that the real exciting stuff was in the portions of the expert report uh, that had been criticized, and they were looking for ways to uh, sneak that in. That did not bind them uh, uh, much quarter uh, with the judge, and they were harshly uh, admonished for that. Anytime that you were sanctioned uh, for that activity, it's pretty uh, uh, severe. The court even noted um, that, using their words, that they they essentially thought that the plaintiff um, had, quote unquote, manufactured uh, the case. Um, from um, going out and hunting uh, for the uh, actual uh, plaintiff um, and knowing that there were certain portions of the expert report that could not be supported. In fact, in cross-examination of the expert, um, the expert conceded that uh, that conclusion uh, should not <laughs> have been in the report. Um, and so, um, you know, you certainly can't do this in a slapdash uh, way and have that go unnoticed by the court. Uh, hey, Philip, we have a question that came in. Um, I'll read it here. Uh, how should a board deal with an unsolicited proposal by another advisor to manage a fund for a lower fee? You have any thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting because um, the, the board's job is, is not to um, to negotiate fees for, for, for shareholders. The, 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 the board's job is not to be, um, the 15C deliberation process is not to be um, adversarial or, or, or unnecessarily antagonistic. Um, I think what the board needs to do when reviewing um, fee, the reasonableness of, of, of fees is to look at um, comparable fees, to look at the services being provided, to look at the strategies that are being uh, put into effect um, and then they should use their business judgment in determining what is is, is reasonable. Um, they certainly need to um, push back and question and test um, and not just blanketly accept 
um, an advisor's representation. They should look to um, independent sources of information um, and to help them with their analysis. Um, and then they 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 they, they use their acumen to um, to, to 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 decide uh, what is um, what 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 is best. I I would agree with that. Really, I think it's important to underscore here that. Courts have determined over and over again that what would be within the fiduciary duty or the responsibility of the board um, does not require the lowest fee. This is the whole reason uh, why we go through this entire test. So I don't think that um, it's problematic uh, for a board if it becomes aware that there is an opportunity to manage the fund for a lower fee by itself. So to your point, the conscientiousness that the board needs to show, uh, as we've said before, is a multi-factored uh, test. And so should the reasonableness of the fee itself um, be a part of that consideration? Yes, but there could be lots of reasons why one manager who can uh, produce a lower fee uh, may not be uh, the best uh, suited uh, for that particular um, uh, company. Um, and so even in Gartenberg, uh, you know, they looked to see whether or not the board simply asked the necessary questions. Um, in, in, in the Great West uh, uh, case, they found that the board went back and asked about fee reductions, breakpoints, mm -hmm. and other considerations in nearly every meeting uh, going back to uh, 2013. And I think that you see this in the analysis of lots of court cases in determining uh, this question of reasonableness. And I, I think that that's an important point because that that's how boards um, and advisors can protect themselves going forward. It's to create and to follow a very robust practice and a robust review um, so that their deliberations um, try as hard as a, a plaintiff might, 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 might try to attack are unassailable. If there is there if there's a clear record that they ask the questions, that they review the materials, um, you know, Great West and, and, and the cases before it um, will be very helpful to them. I, I, I do want to just step back pretty briefly on, on the topic of, of sanctions. Um, Mark, I think you touched upon it um, uh, in, in, in the sense that the plaintiffs were advancing cases that um, or, 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 or putting forth conclusions that they shouldn't have been. I mean, I, I think it's important to note that the court, you know, implicitly recognized that the financial incentive to pursue one of these cases um, might be driving or might have driven the plaintiffs in, in, in Great West. And that was part of the um, the, the, the reason for, 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 for sanctions. Yeah. The litigation costs um, in Great West, I should note, also were not insignificant. Um, it was a great result for defendants and, 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 and it's a great precedent going forward. But when you look step back, you think it was, um, six years um the, the complaint or five years rather the complaint was filed in 2016. there were numerous motions a motion to dismiss a motion for summary judgment discovery motions trial motions depositions electronic discovery an 11-day bench trial um 13 fact witnesses which included the board of directors three expert witnesses you need to have a pretty hearty appetite and stomach for um litigation risk um to, to 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 see some of these cases through to the end um and and, and that that we shouldn't give short shrift to that to to, to 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 that either yeah, well certainly the clients won't um and so there are lots of reasons um that a fund would want to avoid being embroiled uh, in, in these in these litigations you know historically courts have hesitated uh to decide 36b actions on summary judgment and so they prefer instead, because it's so fact intensive, to take these things to trial. So it's a huge time uh, and economic investment. Um, and so I think that's one of the principal reasons that a lot of these are, are driven toward and uh, even fund, fund boards who um, would be otherwise confident based on the history, the case history um, of ultimate success a hub may find that a rather hollow victory if after six years uh, and having to go through the ex expense of trial, um, you know, they can just slap a win uh, on on the uh, on the matter because uh, there are a lot more considerations uh, than just that. 
Right. And, 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 and to that point, I mean, it is a fact intensive inquiry. And um, under the federal pleading standards under 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 Twombly, um, you know, you have to, to, to support, um, you know, you have to plead sufficient facts to, to, to support your, your, your claim. But on a motion to dismiss, the court is bound to accept all of those factual allegations as true. You can't look beyond the four corners of the complaint. So that takes you, um, you know, I shouldn't say easily, but, um, you know, e even if, if, if someone files a motion to dismiss, there's an opportunity to amend your complaint to remedy your pleading, um, which, you know, the, the litigation cost is, is not insignificant. I mean, there have been several cases when you look through the case history uh, where defendants have been successful in partial motions, um, but getting rid of the, the whole case, um, you know, hardly uh, ever happens. So there'll be something obviously left to litigate. Well, that, that kind of takes us to kind of like our, 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 our kind of our last point. As we look ahead and in, in, in going forward, um, there's a congressman out of Minnesota who's been advocating for the mutual fund litigation reform um, and, and has introduced a bill in, in the House on several occasions now. Um, can, can you give us a, a brief summary of the Mutual Fund Litigation Reform Act as proposed by Congressman Emmer? Uh, sure, this is a, a really the third, uh, second and in in identical iteration um, of legislation that was, that was uh, offered under prior administration is now in a new Congress. Um, and so the complaint uh, standard that uh, he, he's offering in this bill um, requires the plaintiffs to, to state with particularity um, all facts uh, that is the, would establish a breach of fiduciary duty um, and um, and that the security holder will have the burden of proving a breach of fiduciary duty by clear and convincing uh, evidence. So we don't have much time to get bogged down in the standards uh, here, um, but you have essentially a, a more likely than not for the non uh, attorneys up on the uh, on the on the call. Um, clear and convincing is a step above that. It's obviously below a criminal standard. So it is uh, both creating a particularity, uh, a, an express particularity uh, requirement, uh, which we often see in fraud-based cases, uh, a particularity standard. And pleading that is often very difficult because the plaintiff uh, or the plaintiff's bar sometimes doesn't have all the facts uh, necessary uh, to um, ar clearly articulate. Um, they see the difference in uh, fee X or fee Y determine it to be excessive. This is some of the issues that come up um, in uh, these cases um, that are the subject of dispositive motions early on. So here we kind of have a codification um, of a heightening uh, standard. It is a bill that has had been and is supported by uh, the ICI um, and hoping, I believe, to tamp down some um, improvidently uh, brought uh, cases in the first place that are merely driven without much opportunity for success um, on uh, a, a payday, which is essentially um, the reason that uh, this bill has been offered. And, and as of now, I think the bill is still stuck in committee, though, right? Is that yeah? So in this current uh, Congress, so in the last uh, uh, Congress, um, it did get out the House, House Financial Services Committee, um, but interestingly, with you know uh, some time left in that Congress. Um, it was not brought up for a vote. It's questionable whether or not this will ever get a House Financial Services, um, at least in, in this Congress. And if it did, it still has to be brought uh, to the floor by uh, the current speaker. And so lots of reasons why we might not expect to see this bill uh, pass anytime soon. So this was um, for, 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 for the question from the audience. I, I don't have the particular bill number, but this is the Mutual Fund Litigation Reform Act. It was introduced by uh, Congressman Tom Emmer in February 2021 um, in, in the current Congress. Um, and and, and to just to put a final point on it, if passed, um, this would kind of be a little bit of a gatekeeper um, and would enable courts to terminate lawsuits that lack um, merits on a motion to dismiss before they get to this very expensive discovery phase. Not not all lawsuits, obviously, but would would you know I would expect it to be a little bit of um, a deterrent for um, for plaintiffs who are just seeking for um, seeking settlements. Right, entirely true. Right. Um, we are out of time. It is time to land the plane. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining me and, and, and sharing your insights. 
That was a great discussion. Thanks for having me. Just a, a programming note, Coffee Chat will be taking next week off as we wish you and your loved ones a very happy Thanksgiving. Um, but please come back the following Wednesday, December 1st. Our colleague, Bib Strange will provide the top 10 list of things to check when launching an ETF. Uh, if you've missed uh, a past coffee chat or would like to watch a rebroadcast of this coffee chat, please visit our library of recordings, which are available um, on the Thompson Hine channel on YouTube. Uh, thank you for attending today's program. Please fill out your survey um, when you log off. We are very much interested in your feedback. Uh, until next time, enjoy the start of the holiday season. Thanks a lot.